beautiful mama and blossoming baby bump. This is your host, Chrissy Long from Blissful Birthing, helping to transform the world one blissful birth at a time. And today's guest is the very infamous Yolanda Norris Clark from, I don't know, from Free Birthing Society, also from the Bauhaus um, community. She basically is just an absolute powerhouse when it comes to all things feminine, mothering, female birth. Yeah, so lucky to have you here today. I feel really humbled that you took the call and are on today's podcast. And there's just so many things I want to talk to you about, but we'll just start firstly with your introduction, Yolanda. How did you get into all of this um, birthing world, especially free birthing? What was your journey? Wow, thank you so much, Chrissy. I'm, I'm so delighted to be here with you. Thank you for inviting me. And um, <laughs> I have to laugh at the infamous part. Yeah, I guess that's true in a way. Isn't it? I just had a conversation with another a friend who's in the birth world and we there, there are only a couple of kind of social media birth groups that I, I haven't yet been kicked out of. Um, <laughs> this other friend is in one of those same groups and she just said very unabashedly the other day, like, they really hate you there, don't they, yo? I mean, they really just can't stand you. And I think it's quite funny. And I, I don't think that's quite true that they actually hate me, but I, I have managed to, <laughs> to rub a lot of people the wrong way in the birth world and not by design. Right. Maybe it does. I think, I think in a way it does. <laughs> yeah, well, considering, considering the landscape of what is considered normal in the world of birth, um, yeah, I, I can't help but think that maybe I'm doing something right because a lot of what, what goes on um, in, in, in home births as well as hospital births, um, in my view, isn't, isn't right. So how did I get into birth? Um, well, I was pregnant at 19 wow. and yeah, I had just turned 40. So that was 20 years ago, over 20 years ago. I and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I knew, I think I knew, well, I, I did know throughout my entire childhood, th throughout my whole life that, that uh, I wouldn't give birth in the hospital. And that's thanks to my mom, really, who was very, very open and uh, very communicative with me from as young as I can remember about my own experience of being born. And my mom, uh, yeah, was just very... She, she told me my birth story repeatedly from a very young age and, and was very clear about how um, what was done to her and me in that experience was um, very traumatic and very damaging. And so I grew up with this kind of idea that um, the hospital wasn't a place that I wanted to, to be. And actually, you know, in, in many ways, my mom was um, really... Uh, ahead of her time and very open-minded and really dedicated to raising us um, in a very holistic way. And so when we were sick, we were treated with, you know, herbs, rest, you know, energy work, as opposed to um, visiting doctors. And I'm really grateful for that as well. So when I found out that I was pregnant when I was 19, I knew immediately that I wouldn't be giving birth at home. And uh, I was living in British Columbia at that time where I grew up. And that year, I think, I think, was it, um, I think it was 1998. That was, I think, the year that regulated, certified um, institutional midwifery had been established for the first time in British Columbia. So um, regulated midwifery was implemented first um, in Canada, in Ontario, and then it kind of rippled outwards and, and, and the other provinces followed. And actually, to my knowledge, um, there is still a province in Canada that doesn't, that hasn't yet implemented regulated midwifery, but most provinces have. So anyway, this was 20 years ago in BC and, and it was the first year that, that regulated midwifery was in place. And I heard about this uh, and was delighted. You know, this is mm -hmm. wonderful. I can, I can have the birth that I want, uh, which was a home birth. I was very clear on that. And I can hire a midwife and um, it'll all be great. And um, I actually ended up 
miscarrying um, that first baby. Um, I think I was around 12 weeks pregnant. And so that actually was an interesting experience because I had had this very clear idea that I would give birth at home, but when I began to miscarry and I, it was incredibly painful and, you know, very dramatic and, you know, I was bleeding a lot. I, uh, I just assumed there was something wrong. And so I went to the hospital and I essentially had a, a hospital miscarriage. And that experience was so horrific in so many ways that, um, I actually will never forget leaving kind of walking out of the hospital after having been, you know, put on morphine for many hours and I had a really violent DNC and I asked to like to see the fetus. I wanted to see my baby and I was um, just scorned and dismissed and, and sort of laughed at. Um, and I'm sure that that had partly to do with the fact that I was so young. You know, I think very young women are um, really discriminated against quite seriously in the system. Um, and, and also older women as well. Um, so I'm kind of at the end of that spectrum now. And it's interesting for me to look back on that experience and see the parallels. Um, cause I work with a lot of, um, you know, geriatric mothers, as they say, mm -hmm. um, myself. So anyway, I, uh, I will, will never forget leaving the hospital and, um, feeling the sun on my face and kind of feeling like I was free finally. And I just had this profound knowing that I would never, ever go back there to wow. that place. And uh, it turns out that I found out that I was pregnant two weeks later. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And so that was very unexpected and, and quite shocking and a little bit distressing at first. Um, but it was then that I really felt like I had been gifted by this this miscarriage um, with this sense of of um, yeah enhanced power and knowing and so I really had a lot more clarity actually at that point even just a few weeks later um, that that I would be experiencing the totality of whatever ended up transpiring um, in in my own power but um, I didn't really understand the politics of it well I didn't understand the politics of midwifery at all and so. I discovered that, like I said, midwifery had been instituted in this province, and so I was delighted, and and I wouldn't have to pay out of pocket um, the the um, the uh, Canadian national health care system would 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 cover all of my costs. And so I called the midwifery office, and uh, they said, "Yeah, that's that's great. Okay, you're pregnant." Um, I was living on the Sunshine Coast at the time, uh, just outside of Vancouver, you know, kind of a rural. Um, island-esque location and uh, the College of Midwifery informed me that they would be assigning me a midwife mm -hmm. and that seemed a little strange because I figured that wouldn't it be sort of intrinsic to the whole concept of midwifery itself that a pregnant woman would choose her own midwife so that right off the bat seemed a little, a little off but okay apparently there was only one midwife in my area one registered midwife in my area. And so I met with her three times and all on all three of those occasions, uh, she made comments and statements that um, were incongruous to me, um, incongruous in regards to what I saw as kind of the foundational elements of what constituted uh, the kind of care that I wanted anyway. So for example, on our very first meeting, she said, um, you know, when would you like to schedule your first ultrasound? And I had done a little bit of preliminary research on ultrasound, um, enough to know that I would never have an ultrasound, that mm -hmm. I had no interest in having an ultrasound because, um, you know, what I gleaned right off the bat was that there really wasn't any proof that ultrasound was safe, um, that there wasn't really a lot of concrete objective benefits. Um, and on an energetic level, I just didn't feel 
it just didn't seem right to me somehow. I, I didn't really have a clear picture exactly of why, but uh, this machine that that kind of produced this fuzzy black and white image, it just didn't appeal to me and I wasn't interested. Um, and it felt much more in alignment with the kind of environment that I had just had this kind of transformational experience um, in becoming aware that I, I, I wasn't aligned with at all. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I said to the midwife, oh, oh no, actually I'm not having ultrasounds. She was taken aback. And I, I remember being quite interested in her response to my simply declining. She, I could sense that she felt a little bit nervous and, and it kind of threw her off to hear that I wasn't having an ultrasound. Um, but again, I sort of thought, this is strange. This is not what I, what I, what I imagined midwifery to be, you know, I imagined that authentic midwifery was, you know, getting to know a woman who I felt personally drawn to and developing a, a beautiful, intimate um, kind of mentor, uh, you know, teacher, uh, you know, love based relationship. And that this woman would guide me in implementing exactly what my own views and choices were as opposed to feeling like I was somehow obligated to um, yeah acquiesce to yeah. her recommendations and you that's what I was right? feeling yeah you're not leading it she is exactly yeah. exactly and I really picked up on that right away and you know I was also <laughs> it's funny you know at that age I I was like I said I was 19 and I was just really angry about a lot of things. Like I was a baby, I was a teenager. Um, and I, I, I was really kind of in my, at that, you know, the apex of my you know, raging against all, all of the, all of the machines. <laughs> so that was part of it too. Um, and I think that served me well, you know, I look back on, on that. And I think without that sort of propulsive, I don't know, um, anger and suspicion and, and even cynicism, I'm kind of grateful for that energy in a way because it, it put me in a position where I, I like, I, I was, I was really strong and I knew exactly what I wanted and I'm, I'm proud of that. So anyway, we had another couple of meetings and at each of these meetings, this, this midwife continued to bring up ultrasound to the point where I, I actually said, listen, <laughs> you don't seem to be understanding me. I'm not doing that. And I'm starting to get the feeling that we're not really in alignment. Um, anyway, that sort of set off uh, an interesting kind of chain of events. And I ended up, uh, I remember going to her office and requesting a copy of the, um, the kind of uh, the official guidebook that, that delineated all of the, um, all of the, the, the kind of specifics of, of how, she was um, enabled to, to practice um, in terms of the, uh, the, the BC College of Midwifery. So I, I asked for her kind of official documentation because I wanted to know exactly what I was signing up for, you know, in, in this relationship with her. And so I, I actually really appreciate the fact that she, she actually did. She handed over this enormous binder and I took it home and I, I remember like photocopying certain pages and then highlighting passages. And I brought the, this whole thing back to her. And I said, you know, I, what I, what I have discovered in reading this is that you don't actually work for me because, you know, here's this part. And it says that, for example, if I remain pregnant past 41 weeks, you are obligated to, you know, initiate all of these induction procedures. And then at a certain point, you're obligated to either take me to the hospital or withdraw your care. So on what level does that indicate that I have any power or authority at all? You know, if I, the pregnant mother, am not dictating and calling the shots, then, then what is this even about? This isn't midwifery. And I'll never forget what she said. <sighs> it was quite sad, actually. She, she said, you know, I actually, I understand. Um, because she had worked as an independent midwife. So she ended up sharing a little bit of her story with me and she had worked for quite a few years as a completely independent midwife prior to regulation. And then what happened was that the government came in um, and they very kind of slyly uh, approached all of these independent midwives and said, listen, 
you women have been working so hard for so many years and you have no insurance and you have no safety net and it's a struggle and you're not sure, you know, how many births you're going to have one month to the next. Why don't you come with us and we'll give you um, all of this, you know, we'll give you this, this beautiful safety net and we'll, we'll protect you and we'll certify you and then you'll be official and, you know, in the eyes of the community and in the eyes of the law, you'll have all of these, um, you'll be legitimized, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you uh, kind of join our join our cabal, <laughs> not a cabal, our club, yeah. join our, join our <laughs> association, right? Um, and this particular midwife who I had, um, whose services I had engaged had, had done that very thing. And so she'd been working in the system only for a year, but she was actually quite an experienced independent midwife. And she said to me in her office, when I brought this binder back and said, mm -mm, I think I have to sever our relationship because I'm not going to be able to uh, get what I want from you because mm -hmm. of the kind of regulations that you're functioning under. She actually said to me, um, you know, Yolanda, I totally understand. And if I had a daughter, I would advise her to do the same thing. Wow. Yeah. Sure. It was so powerful. It, yeah. It was really powerful, but it was also really sad to me because yeah. what that indicated was that she was working in this system that she herself recognized was entirely out of integrity. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and she had kind of you know, signed her Faustian pact, you know, it was, she, she had, she had relinquished her integrity in exchange for what I see now as really just, what I see now is really just the illusion of uh, safety and protection and, and uh, legitimacy. So, at that point, I felt great. You know, I was I was free, free to go. Um, <laughs> and I had free and alone. Free and alone. And actually, no, I felt great about it because this was again, this is 20 years ago. And so uh, I had just discovered the internet. Um, mm -hmm. And at that point, the internet was censorship free. It was the sort of glorious open library that um, it was kind of you know, thought to be at the time. And so I had discovered this amazing world of unassisted childbirth. And so I was reading all of these beautiful um, firsthand accounts of these very radical women in various corners of the world who had given the birth to their babies on mountaintops or given birth to their babies, you know, in a treehouse or what have you. And that was it. I, that, that's what I was going to do. It was no problem. You know, I'm, 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 an, I'm a human animal. i I conceived this child without any, um, you know, interference and I could give birth without any interference too. So I was totally adamant that this is what I was going to do. And a couple of weeks later, I got a call from the BC College of Midwifery. And they told me that they had got wind of the fact that I had released my midwife from our arrangement. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to let me know that if my baby died, I would be charged with murder and I would be taken to jail. Oh my word. And would no you like way. to reconsider? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. wow, yeah. That's not yeah. remotely manipulative or threatening. <gasps> oh, I mean, isn't that amazing? This is this is an organization wow. ostensibly set up to, you know, support mothers and, you know, mother-centered child, but all of their, you know all of their cliched catch, catchphrases and here they were threatening me um and intimidating. attempting intimidating me attempting to intimidate me anyway and attempting to coerce me into rethinking my you know very irresponsible decision and so that was interesting and they ended up harassing me throughout my pregnancy really? um mm -hmm. yeah and actually i think that in some ways it's a little bit worse now because they didn't call Child Protective Services on me, thank goodness. Um, but I see that a lot happening these days, actually. So, you know, it's funny because I mentioned my mom at the beginning of our, our talk, Chrissy, and um, I'll, I'll, my mom used to say things to me like, you know, when I was just a kid, you know, giving birth was so horrific, you know, at the beginning, I was born in 1981, and you know, in 1981, 
And I'm so glad, Yolanda, that you will be alive to see the shift that is coming. You know, birth is, you know, there's, there's, there's a radical shift coming and birth is changing and more and more women are, 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 are waking up to, you know, their power and, um, and things are going to change in the hospital system and it's going to get a lot better. And, you know, when, when it's time for you to have your children, it's going to be so much better. And, you know, in a way, that's completely true. I mean, we see, you know, Chrissy, the work that you're doing, and so many more women are stepping into these positions of of, of being leaders um, in their communities in regards to holistic birth. And I think there is a real shift. But on another level, when it comes to the way that birth is done still within the institution, I actually think things have become a lot worse. So, so that mm -hmm. shift has taken place, but it's taken place and it is taking place in a much different way than, you know, my, my mother conceived of it 40, 40 years ago, right? It's, it's things, things are not changing from the inside. And I don't think that ever really does happen. I think uh, real revolution, um, occurs outside of existing structures and and i definitely see that now so yeah i uh i i was all set to have my unassisted birth feeling great about that although being also harassed by the bc college of midwives and i ended up um re getting the name of of a radical of of uh, someone who was described to me as as an underground midwife um and actually it was the friend of, of my father's at the time. Um, and, uh, and she had had a home birth with this underground, illegal, radical midwife. And, you know, she thought very highly of this woman. And, you know, I, I had made this choice that I would have an unassisted birth, but I was still really interested in connecting with, um, with other women in the community because I really didn't have anyone around me at that point. I didn't have any support. And, you know, my mother was supportive but she had had only hospital births and so she didn't really have the context to to fully um yeah hold me in in that choice so i got this name and uh, of this woman like written on a little piece of paper her name was gloria lemay and i called her up and i asked her if we could have a meeting and uh she lived a ferry ride away from me because i was on the coast and she was in vancouver so i took the trek into the city to to meet up with her and the moment that I walked into her apartment and just kind of laid eyes on her and met her and, 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 you know, we started chatting, it was like, oh, oh, this is midwifery. Oh, wow. This, this woman is the wise woman that I've been looking for. Um, and right. Gloria was just, she was so warm and, uh, and so strong and so rooted in her own convictions in such a powerful way that I felt totally safe in my own convictions, if that makes sense. Like she, mm -hmm. she was so open and so clear about what she believed to be true um, in a way that just, yeah, it was just, it was so real. It wasn't, there was no, there was no kind of additional layer of, of institutionalization, I think is, is really what, it was in so many ways but also Gloria herself was was absolutely amazing so this is this is Gloria LeMay who is um yeah forever my my uh one of my 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 greatest mentors and um and I told Gloria you know then I was probably I don't know maybe 14 or 15 weeks pregnant when I first met her you know I said to her yeah I'm, I'm I, I don't want anyone with me I'm doing this entirely on my own I don't need anybody I'm totally fine and Gloria was like that's wonderful that's so great um, by the way I'm doing a birth attendant training program you know, starting soon that might be something that you would be interested in and it hadn't ever crossed my mind that I would ever become a birth worker at that point but I did want to learn as much as I could about birth and I had already read every single book that I could get my hands on you know I was um, you know scouring the internet for all of these alternative perspectives and then I also read all of the um, the kind of mainstream books like what to expect when you're expecting I read all of Ina May's books and I was in such a I think I am by nature very critical and analytical mm -hmm. and so I was reading all of these books from the perspective of you know this this really deep sense of knowing that I had that, um, that I don't need anything and that I am absolutely powerful enough to do this 
by myself. Um, and so I was probably more critical of, of that mainstream birth stuff than, than I might even be now, which maybe is saying a lot, I don't know. But yeah, I just, I was, I was voracious in my, in my research. And, uh, and so I jumped at the opportunity to do this training course with Gloria and her program was really, um, it, it, uh, I ended up traveling to Vancouver every week for the next several weeks anyway, to do this program with her. And, um, and I just, I learned so much. And, uh, and even then I never really, I think it was partly because I did learn so much that I actually felt like I don't, I don't want, I don't want to be in the birth world. Like I, I ended up hearing so many stories about, you know, really, really, really learning um, about this political dynamic right mm -hmm. this the 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 entire kind of um the, the way that the government had so successfully and so insidiously appropriated midwifery and kind of was in this process of turning it into something that was actually very very different from what i think a lot of people had understood midwifery to be and you know that's ongoing now um you know there's this this just continuous cycle of um i think attempting to subvert women's power um mm -hmm. in in many I ways see. and yeah. Totally. Yeah. I mean, and it, it's interesting uh, to yeah. kind of look at the history of midwifery in the longer term, mm -hmm. because, you know, in the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries, um, midwifery was stamped out in a much more aggressive, much more overt way, right? It was done through uh, the, the, the witch hunts and, and these trials where <laughs> women healers... Sorry, go ahead. Putting people to death. Yeah, that's quite quite hideous. Really. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And you know, I, I don't know if you've read um, uh, um, Barbara Ehrenreich and Deirdre English, their book, um, Witches, Midwives, and Nurses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A yeah. tiny, yeah, isn't, isn't it wonderful? It really, I, I, I'm, I'm so grateful for yeah. that, that work because it really Thank brought you. home um, the parallels. I mean, it's really essentially exactly the same thing that mm -hmm. has been done to to midwifery now as then, only using slightly different kind of tactics. And mm -hmm. and I think then as now, the impetus is really economic, uh, primarily. Um, it's 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 money and power. I mean, everything kind of comes down to money and power, right? But um, I think one of the reasons that independent birth workers need to be um, silenced, uh, stopped, you know, prevented from practicing, criminalized, is because um, I think so much of the overall dependencies that we, that we see and experience in the world in, in every way, shape and form, you know, our, our, our sense of dependency on the allopathic medical system, but also <laughs> yeah, so I mean, our, our sense of dependency on the allopathic medical system, um, but also our um, just the sense of, of, of lack and, and overconsumption and um, uh, you know, psychological dependencies on all of these various institutions. I think so much of that is rooted in uh, the kind of uh, trauma that the world of institutional obstetrics is actually designed to inflict. Mm -hmm. And that trauma is essential um, in order to perpetuate a lot of these, these systems that again are rooted in, in money and power. Um, so we, we just can't have women, you know, running around thinking that they own their bodies and mm -hmm. knowing that, you know, we have the power to create life without any kind of intervention or, or, or yeah, it, it just, it, it wouldn't work because then we'd be raising our children as 
sovereign, free, whole, powerful beings as well. And then we discover that anyway, just it wouldn't work. You know, it would it be a mess. It it would we would comply. <laughs> we wouldn't comply to things. We wouldn't see the need for rules and laws. We'd be like, we can do whatever we like. We're all powerful. Exactly. Yeah, which doesn't work if you want to be a dictatorship, right? Or a domineering, scary system. Exactly. So, yeah. Wait, it's so needed and I'm like oh I'm so grateful to people like you and for discovering my doula at the time for finding this power that I never knew I possessed until right isn't it amazing I, I mean it's that. the biggest open secret yeah. right yeah it really is and if you somehow managed to skirt the system intentionally like you did or with me it was like a bit of luck finding this doula as well and, and going for it yeah. it's like oh my god so now anything's possible exactly it's something that we're told we really can't do and we're gonna die and it's you know barbaric and painful and this and that and you actually discover no it isn't it's amazing that was the most exactly. amazing powerful spiritual thing i've ever had then and you start to question everything don't you like well, what else is a lie <laughs> like or what else am i capable exactly. of and you know oh well, so i can do things my way i don't have to follow and like you said, you start raising your children differently, you start living your life differently, thinking, well, I don't maybe have to stay in the same town that I was born in my whole life and do the job that I was expected to do. Maybe I can think outside the box. Um, but yeah, it would cause a revolution of sorts. And it's happening. It is it's slowly happening mm. with maybe just 5% of the population right now. But that's why I, I find it incredible how I can relate basically any scenario that's a little bit outside of the box to birth. Because I'm like, well, it's just like birth, isn't it? It's just birth is the micro of this you know, macro thing. Exactly. And, you know, what's happening right now in terms of this um, this immense kind of shift in uh, in in the world, you know, what, yeah. what everything that happened in 2020 is like, oh, OK, we're this is this is it we're we're here this is what we're <laughs> yeah. it's so similar isn't it because it's so much fear so much control so much propaganda so many lies so much manipulation and then you can either buy into that and become dependent on these systems or you can go i see this for what it is this is bullshit like i mean people like you and i saw it from day one we're like really like we live with viruses uh -uh. all the time what's what's really going on like this is really strange this reaction but I was expecting so many more people to have that same reaction. I was more shocked at how few we seem to be. I was like, yeah. no, surely not. Like, surely most people aren't this fear riddled or aren't this indoctrinated. Like, they're intelligent people, a lot of them, like really intelligent people. Um, and then you realize, no, it's, it's the system has worked for them for so long. Exactly. So We've all kind of been blindsided I don't know but I'm like really it's been going on a year now and there's more and more proof and more and more evidence yet still some people mm. just don't or maybe they can't because it does take a lot of humility to realize that what you've been fed this whole time and what you've believed is complete crap um it takes courage right it, it does and it's it does yeah, and not, you know one of the immense gifts of Rona, I mean, I call it Rona because I, yeah. I get flagged and censored if I if I use the other term. Um, but it's really, I, it has felt like such a huge gift to me because it has brought to my awareness just how how, how much I was still in the matrix, actually, in so many ways. You know, the 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 the, the ways that I had not made all of these connections to their fullest extent actually so you know i i think i had in a way kind of compartmentalized um the healthcare system and the obstetric system and and hadn't quite fully recognized that um well actually the academic sphere is fully integrated in these broken or deliberately um, manipulative systems as well. Um, so, you know, I come from a pretty academic family and I was expected to, you know, thrive academically and I did. Um, but I hadn't quite fully explored the extent to which um, the pharmaceutical um, cartels actually 
fund and and even you know write medical textbooks right mm-hmm. so um it's it's interesting that the term conspiracy theorist is being has been become so so normalized and weaponized um because what i have come to recognize is that these are open conspiracies all of the information is available to anyone who who wishes to take a look at it and um and so my my understanding of of what health actually is and of how our bodies function has has become a real focus of my work of late and i've been immersed in the study of german new medicine which relates to birth so profoundly so prior to rona i i i held very firmly uh, the belief system that my body has the capacity to heal. You know, I don't see doctors, I, allopathic physicians. I, I haven't, I, I haven't engaged in that system in, you know, almost 25 years. Um, but I didn't quite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, good for me. Yeah, I just feel I feel very lucky, actually. Yeah. Um, because yeah. Uh, I've we have the like only. The Really, really, we really do. I had to go once recently because one of my kids had this skin thing, you know, because we live in Costa Rica too, and it just wouldn't go away with natural remedies. And I was like, damn it, I'm going to have to go to a doctor. And he was horrible, horrible. I got so, like, I felt so violated and aggressive in there, you know? I was like, I don't even want to be here. Why am I here? But she needed to go on antibiotics. And none of my other kids have ever been on them. She was only That's one. Hard. I was like, no, I don't want to have to do this. Aww. but really getting out of control so yeah that's yeah. why I said good for you because I mean I've done everything to try and stay out of it as well and I'm like oh I'm sure there must have been something natural but it just wasn't working <laughs> oh, it's so anyway. hard. and yeah I mean of course there are exceptions right and and I think yeah. you know there are um amazing uh I mean allopathic medicine is, is incredible when it comes to comes to surgery and yet I don't know if I can really think of an example of an instance in which I would go there. I mean, maybe a, a car accident, God, God us forbid, touch wood. Um, mm-hmm. But, but you know, this, I get these questions a lot. You know, I, I, people often ask me, you know, well, are there, what if this were to happen or what if that were to happen? Would you go then? And, you know, maybe, I don't know, but, um, but what's really important to me is to, frame this whole discussion around what choices we make um, in the context of of uh, whose authority it is, right? Mm-hmm. I think that human beings have a right, a, a fundamental inalienable right to make any and all decisions um, for ourselves when it comes to our bodies. and. And this is a very controversial position, but I actually feel like human beings also have a right to death. I I don't want, I don't want to be hooked up to, you know, machines. I don't want my life extended um, using technology personally. And I I think that that technology exists. And for those who who choose to go that route, sure. But there's really, um, I think that the sort of larger piece that's, so important um, in all of this that's taken place over this past year related to Rona especially is the fundamental concept of bodily integrity and and medical decision making Um, and that's at the core of my perspective on birth as well is is the very radical notion that uh, women are people and that we're fully functioning um, you know, thinking human beings who have a right to make any and all choices when it comes to our birth. And that is still a concept that I think many, many people don't really understand and can't really wrap their minds around. Like, but, but, but what if, what if something were to happen? You know, but like the doctor knows best and. Right. It's taking yeah. responsibility, isn't it? And saying, well, if it does, it does. It's my choice. That's my responsibility. It's my life. And something that Rona's really highlighted for me as well is like, okay, so what is life? What is living? And what is dying? Like, let's have some maturity about this, you know? And you are presented with this if you've given 
birth, well, especially if you free birth like you and I have many, many times, you know that there is an element of risk, obviously, with each and every birth, be it free birth, midwife assisted in a hospital, I think even more of a risk in a hospital, but fine. As there is a risk when you get in the car and drive, like there is no guarantee, but of course you can minimize the risk by making sure you can drive the car, the car is safe, you're looking out, you're not drunk, and you can minimize the risk of your birth, you know, going really well if you put lots of things in place as well. But I think there does come a point where you have to get comfortable with a certain degree of risk if you want to live. If you don't mm -hmm. want to live in fear all the time, if you want to actually have a life on your terms. So I have come to terms with that, that, okay, if I get in the car, yeah, there's, there's a slight risk I might die. I'm not going to get all worried about it and not drive again. And it's the same with giving birth. I'm not going to not have babies because people say to me, oh, you know, you had two. They turned out healthy and safe. You should stop now. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? Like, no. <laughs> and, and it's the same with the free birth. They're like, oh, you shouldn't really do that again at your age. You're geriatric because I'll be 43. And I'm like, do you know what? I'm comfortable with that tiny, tiny risk. I'm going to be fine. And if I'm not, then I'm not. And, you know, yeah. I'll, I will deal with that if that happens. And it's the same with this whole Rona thing. It's like, for goodness sake, people, we are all going to die. Like, wake up. Be mature about it. We don't know how, we don't know when, but you are going to die. There's no way you can escape it. And why not live your life before that happens on your terms? Not in fear, not being a nutter, like irresponsible, bungee jumping off everything. Of course not. But, you know, within the, the reasonableness that you feel you're enjoying yourself. Like, I don't want to exist. I don't want to just survive hidden in my home, never seeing my relatives again. Um, my children's never interact with another person. That's not living to me. Then, you know, then I can honestly see why people are, not that I encourage it, but why people feel suicidal. Because if that's life forevermore, then it's just not worth it. Like, I'd rather die sweet death and go out there without a mask on, you know? because I really don't think the risk is high at all. I think it's, you know, after lots of research we've done, I think it's complete rubbish. Um, and I think this is the scary thing, living in fear like that and changing everything, which brings me kind of to the, well, firstly, I just wanted to ask you, what happened with your first birth? How did it go? <laughs> you know, oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, so, well, I ended up, um, uh, you know, uh, throughout this this program that I that I uh, that I attended with with Gloria teaching, um, I was you know I remained very admin, adamant that I would be having my free birth and that I didn't want anyone around. And Gloria would just say, "You know, that's great. And you know, if you ever change your mind, um, you let me know and I'll be there." Mm -hmm. And uh, near the end of my pregnancy, I did change my mind. Actually, I I felt. Um, I felt a lot of fear, fear of the unknown. Um, and I, I, uh, I had developed with Gloria such a, such a sense of, of just indelible trust that it really felt like the right decision to invite her. And so um, the birth itself was really interesting though, because at every step in the process, um, my body uh, did not adhere to the kind of regulations that would have been imposed had I remained in relationship with the regulated midwife, um, oh. which I found really quite, quite fascinating. So for example, um, my pregnancy did progress past 41 weeks, um, which was sort of the cutoff for this, this regulated system. In fact, I remained pregnant past 43 weeks. Wow, that's hard to be heard mm -hmm. of. So cool. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and so already I felt so much relief that I had you know, shifted my, my relationship to, to a woman who was um, able and willing to, to support me entirely. Um, and it even got to the point where, you know, I was calling Gloria at 42 and 43 weeks pregnant saying, listen, like, there's probably something wrong here. Like, my body's just not like it's not working. And she would say, she, <laughs> actually, at one point, she even said, listen, if you'd like me to come and handcuff you to your house so that you don't go and do something stupid like heading to the hospital, I'll do that. But you've got to understand, this is just fine. 
No, there's nothing wrong with you. Okay, you're fine. So, wow. you know, it, and it's so it's so interesting because she was really only able to offer me that kind of support because she worked for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand the position that regulated midwives are in. Um, you know, most of them are, most of them have gone through an industrial education program, you know, at some university taught by doctors, you know, doing labs in the hospital. Um, mm -hmm. And they come out of that fully indoctrinated themselves into a particular view of birth that is r totally just utterly foreign from 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 the truly holistic perspective, right? And they also come out often with you know hundred thousand dollars in debt, and they're funneled into you know these these institutional programs where they have to practice a certain way or they'll lose their jobs. So mm -hmm. it's simple, right? It's it's this is what professionalization does. And again, the system's not broken. It's designed this way so that we are all basically indentured servants to the state. Right. So I went past 40, 43 weeks um, and then my waters released all of a sudden one one afternoon at a tea party. Um, yeah. And it was very dramatic and, and, and exciting, but nothing was happening. You know, it felt like nothing was happening. I wasn't feeling sensations. And so there was another example of, you know, my my waters were open for, I don't know, something like 12 hours and the cutoff in the regulated midwifery system is like four hours or six hours or whatever. So here again is another example of, of an instance that, uh, um, you know, a pretext that would have been used to initiate a transfer. And then my birth process did begin and it was just so different from what I was expecting, Chrissy. Oh my goodness. I really had this impression. Yeah, I mean, you know, I here I was like this sort of arrogant young woman who thought I was all powerful. And I had heard all of, you know, I, I like I said, I'd immersed myself in birth stories and I'd read all the books and, you know, I'd listened and, 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 and watched and, and read all these stories where women were, you know, expressing how how challenging birth was and, and I had read all the all of this or, or or encountered all of these these stories and thought to myself well you know sure birth is hard for most women but I'm special and I'm incredibly <laughs> strong and this is going to be a walk in the park for me and yeah. it was not it was not <laughs> it was just absolutely the most intense excruciating, mind-blowingly challenging experience of my life. And um, and I'll never forget, so as I mentioned, Gloria lived a, a, a ferry ride away. So it's a bit of a trek to get to me um, where I was at the time. And I, you know, I called her right away when, when things started to really happen. And she said, okay, you know, I'm on my way. But it wasn't for, she didn't arrive for like a day, a day or Whoa. day and a half. Right. So it was hours and hours that I was in the birth process before she even got here. And um, when she finally arrived, I was at the point where I was like, this is not like, this can't be right. There must be some kind of problem because I'm not experiencing this as something that is tolerable or survivable. You know, I was like, I'm basically going to die. Um, so it's a good thing Gloria's here. And, and when she arrived, I was like, okay, phew, she's here. Surely the baby is like right there. You know, the baby's going to come out any moment because I can't keep doing this. Um, yeah. And she walked into my little house and she looked at me with so much love and kindness. And she just said, and I, I remember saying something like, like the, the baby's going to come really soon, right, Gloria? Because I can't, I can't handle this anymore. And, and she just looked at me with such sweetness. And she just said, oh, sweetheart, you're not even in the birth process yet. You're not even close. <laughs> You're not even close. Ooh. And I was, I, I remember feeling angry. Like I was devastated, but also angry. Like, fuck you. How dare you say this to me? Like it just, it, it was, it was unbearable. So another, you know, another day went by and finally I started, started to feel like I was maybe ready to push and I got in the birth pool. Long story short, I pushed my baby out for about seven hours. It was about seven hours of sitting in the birth pool, wow. pushing so, so hard. Now, I'd also invited my mom and my younger brother and sister. So they showed up soon after Gloria arrived. And 
now that I know what I know, that was not a wise decision. I was completely exposed. I felt totally observed. I was really, uh, the dynamic, the sort of energetic dynamics of, of the experience were, were a little weird. Um, but I don't actually regret any of those choices because I was able to kind of learn from that experience and see things differently going forward. But I do think that one of the, one of the reasons that I had such a long pushing stage was because I did feel so observed. Um, but also, you know, I think birth is obviously such an intensely physical experience, but in a way, I think the, the, the psychological and mental and emotional and spiritual aspects of birth are more significant than the physical aspects in a sense. Yeah. And so I, all of this was so new to me and I was feeling a lot of fear and so much resistance. And so I was kind of having to work through all of those dynamics in that experience as well. And so, you know, it was one of those first births and we see a lot of this in first births too. You know, my experience is not unique. You know, I've attended a lot of births uh, for first time mothers that have, have looked and felt like that, but it was just such an inner and physical struggle in, in every mm -hmm. way. And it was one of those kind of long, long pushing stages where, like my baby, like I, like I would, I would crown and, and, and I, I, I could see my baby's head using the mirror and then the sensation would pass and, and it was like my body would suck the baby back in and it felt yeah. like, you know, two steps forward, four steps back. Um, and uh, it was just so, so hard and um, really, really hard. Wow, I had no almost idea. heartbreaking, heartbreakingly hard. Um, yeah. And I, I look at that aspect of the experience too, that very, very long pushing stage. And there's no question that if oh, a regulated no, right. midwife had been there, I would have been transferred. No question at all. Like that, that's just not allowed in the system, right? It's just you not just allowed. That you're failing to progress and you can't Absolutely. relate. Baby too big, Absolutely. Your hips are too Oh, God knows what. All of it. All of it. Yeah. There were so, so many instances, so many, so many periods during the birth that I look back now and I like so many examples of, of, of opportunities to have transferred mm -hmm. me. Right. Yeah. Um, and as, as, as a woman now who, you know, as, as someone who, who has witnessed many births, um, I feel even more grateful thinking about that experience so much more grateful to Gloria than I even was at the time, because I understand now from the perspective of a birth worker, just how, how challenging it is to, to lovingly and calmly bear witness to a mother who's moving through that kind of firewalk because my birth was really, really a hard one. It was one of the hardest births that I've experienced, even, you know, for, for, as a, as a mother, but also as a birth keeper, it was just, it was so, so long and so mm -hmm. arduous. Anyway, finally, my baby was born and, um, and it was amazing. It was, it was just perfect. He, he emerged from my body, even after such a long and difficult birth, um, even after such a long pushing stage, um, healthy and vigorous and you know he was he was blue but as 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 you know as we know uh, blue babies are are normal and fine and he pinked up yeah. right away and um and I was in the pool and I remember just feeling that flush of total ecstasy and connection and and you know spiritual transformation and then quite soon after a wave of I don't know how to describe it other than just sort of like devastation almost, like what have I done? I've brought this beautiful, innocent child into this broken world. Um, and so it was an interesting experience, sort of bliss mixed with kind of melancholy and um, and some sadness. And, you know, I've, I've, I've thought about that a lot this year actually, mm -hmm. because I think there was something that I was picking up on you know in in the, the the collective consciousness about some of the darkness that that we've experienced as a collective over over the past few years so yeah but it was a, it was an amazing birth and then I went on to have um how many more babies I cannot keep track Chrissy this is embarrassing I have given birth to eight children 
(laughs) And so my, uh, my oldest baby is almost 20 years old and our youngest, um, Ignatius is, uh, he'll be two in, um, in June. Yeah. Amazing. And you're not done, are you? You still want another I'm one, right? I'm not done. I definitely want I another baby. It. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's I'm totally so open to another one. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. And obviously that didn't put you off that first birth experience. You learned a lot about the psychological no. and emotional effects of fear. Yes, absolutely. I, I did. And you know, what's interesting too about, about that whole experience, as difficult as it was, is... You know, after I kind of, after I, I, I calibrated, I had a, a challenging postpartum experience, although I was able to recognize that as challenging as it was to be a first time mother alone and isolated, I had no support system really at all. That's another story. But, but I think if I had had a birth experience that had taken place in the institution, if I'd had a hospital birth, Mm-hmm. There's no doubt in my mind that I probably would have ended up with a C-section without oh, a doubt. Yeah. But mm-hmm. also, I'm very clear, I'm very, very sure, um, or it's, it's, it's my thought anyway, my belief anyway, that, that I would have suffered from severe postpartum depression. Because I actually don't really even believe in postpartum depression. I don't think that... Um, you know, I've thought a lot about this over the years, and I, I do a lot of birth trauma work with, with women, and what is called postpartum depression in our culture, I think that term is almost a way of kind of normalizing um, what I see as complex post-traumatic stress disorder um, created or initiated by the abuse that women are, uh, that women experience in, in yeah. the system. Um, so I don't believe at all for a second that there's anything about birth that is inherently depressive. In fact, mm-hmm. it's quite the opposite. Birth is designed to infuse us with, you know, the hormones of ecstasy and to connect us with our babies in a way that's 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 the most powerful form of, of human connection possible. And birth is designed to set us up to adore mothering and to thrive as mothers Um, and it's complicated because we do live in a culture where um, families are fractured and 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 women are isolated and so it's not I I don't want to give the impression that anyone who has a lovely home birth is going to feel great about mothering that's not the case there are so many additional factors involved but in my case I do see that I was able to survive a very challenging mothering experience because I had had such a beautiful, powerful birth. And, um, and, and very soon after I gave birth, you know, even after that sort of feeling of, oh my goodness, what have I done? I've brought a child into this terrible world. Um, I definitely conceptualized my birth as fantastic and amazing. Like I loved it, even mm-hmm. as difficult as it was. I, I, I loved it. I just That's loved so it. Cool. Yeah. And I mean, that really might have been a lot of the reason it took so long to get your baby out. If you were worried about the world it was coming into, that's a huge blocker, isn't it? It's massive. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I was thinking that last year when Rona started, I was just feeling so much compassion to all the pregnant women out there thinking, gosh, would I want to give birth in this scenario? No, I wouldn't. And it's interesting now that I've kind of overcome a lot of the fears with Rona and now I'm like pregnant again. And I'm like, now I feel fine about it. But at the time, you know, it was a lot to work through all these fears and things we're being told and the fact that, you know, if you had to go to hospital, you'd have to have a mask on while you birthed and your partner couldn't be there and your baby would be whisked away. And I was like, oh, my Lord, I don't want to have a baby in that kind of dynamic. Um, whereas now I'm very confident in this is like another test, you know, to remaining sovereign and strong and knowing what I want. Oh my um, goodness, Chrissy! Yeah. Absolutely, I'm I'm yeah. I'm so intrigued that you just used the word test because I'm I'm working on a, on a piece that I'm I'm going to be releasing soon and, and it's kind of rooted in exactly that concept. I I had the same, kind of trajectory around um, what Rona means for for mothering, um, like you at first when it when everything kind of hit the fan. I did have a lot of thoughts about, oh dear, you know, this is our our poor children and, and what a terrible time to, 
to to be young and and all of these sort of maudlin maudlin notions and i've really come full circle to feel as though this is the very most important time to be bringing um, beautiful, whole, free beings into the world. This is the most important time to be a mother. Uh, this is, and it is a test in a sense. You know, I, I, I think the way that we respond or react to everything that's going on is absolutely a test and everyone passes. It's just a question of who we want to be in the world and what we want to learn in this experience of life and where we want to go and, and where our commitments lie. Um, and so I think it's really been a beautiful invitation to all of us to take stock of, of, of who we are and, and who we want to become in this. Yeah, totally. It's made me very clear on who I am and everything because it felt like a minefield at first. And then it was just like so many things that just, no, it's a no-go. Like my kids going to school with masks on, absolutely not going to happen. So you know, just no, exactly. giving birth in that kind of environment is a no, a firm no. And yeah. I never knew how passionate I felt about our freedom, our freedom of speech, even the fact that my kids have play dates with other children all the time, and as many hobbies as possible. Because at first I was like, oh, will they even experience a first kiss? Will they experience love? Because they'll look at each other like they're disease carriers. Like, I don't want this for them, but this future is so bleak. But then I kept getting this call from this little soul that's now you know, in my body. <laughs> and, and, uh, I think it's a boy. He kept saying, I want to come. I have to have a mission. I'm choosing your family. He kept saying, wait, I'm not ready. I'm too old. I'm too tired. Plus, I'm not sure, like, with where, everything that's going on, if I want to bring another person into this world. Um, but he was so there all the time. And then I did my first ever ayahuasca ceremony three months ago and he came again and he was basically just saying do I have permission because I'm here so I think my husband's sperm were right there with the egg they're about to fuse but he was still asking permission because I was ovulating that night and I was like okay fine do it I'm ready now I can do this if you really have such a mission to fulfill then screw it we'll deal with whatever consequences there are um so yeah, I do feel that there are little souls coming in now that are ready. They're meant for this. Yeah. This is what they, they want to be here for. So we don't have to feel that guilt and we just have to keep guiding the best as we see fit, you know. And, and we talk a lot to our children about Rona and the politics and, and just viruses and how so that they're not scared and that they can, you know, hold their own in situations because children do repeat what their parents say and there are some kids in their homeschooling school that just come out with the craziest things where I'm like, oh, no, you need to be informed as well. You know, <laughs> you can't think that you need to have your temperature taken every day and wear masks. Hey, beautiful mama, I'm so sorry. Um, it went a little bit sketchy after that conversation because we're both in Costa Rica. So um, yeah, the line dropped. So I'm sorry, I couldn't go into more depth there about the whole virus discussion, but rest assured that I will be releasing a solo cast very shortly about virology, which is basically about how viruses work and how we interact with them. So um, I won't leave you hanging there if you're interested to learn more about yeah, how viruses work, especially coronavirus. Um, and thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you really got a lot out of listening to Yo and her amazing birth stories. And um, yeah, love you all lots and see you at the next episode. Thank you.